Thank you so much for your patience. Oh my goodness. All right, I don't be I don't know where to begin except to apologize. Thank you so much. All right. And so um what I'll begin to do now is is do the uh, mark down the extra credit for those of you. And boy, are you gonna get extra credit this time? That was a mess. All right. And that that will not stay that way, okay? I promise. So still some a hiccup I'm still trying to take care of on my part. Um, let's see here. So give me just a moment. Um, are you guys doing okay? Uh, are there any questions, anything that I need to be um, aware of as your instructor? You got it. Sure. Sant Singh, you got that. Be happy to do that. Um, to attend to that as soon as I can. All right. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to double up your names. That's why I'm taking so long. I apologize. Looking for them on my list. Okay, no problem, Rahaf. Be happy to as well, okay? Thank you for your patience. Let's see here. Get through here. So today we're going to do the Black Legend, okay, or, or the Spanish. And what happens, right? Is with the um, with the Spanish, they're going to um, they're going to be uh, made villains. They're going to be villainized uh, right off the bat in the 1500s and 1600s in the early modern era. Uh, they're going to be uh, such will be done to them uh, primarily by Protestant, uh, Dutch, and English historians and chroniclers. Right, so they uh, they go after them. And um, to this day, what can happen is they could very um, conveniently um, serve as a uh, an anti-model, right? And as the name implies, if you haven't heard of that term, right, it's just um, you uh, the antithesis, the absolute opposite. Everything that someone could look at uh, regarding uh, how you behaved historically. And they could contend to their students through a history book, through critical analysis uh, of your history, uh, basically tell uh, students, right, teach them, uh, this is exactly how we do not want to be as a civilization, okay? And so uh, the why everything bad has to be black is an argument for another day, uh, per perhaps even next uh, week. When we hit on slavery in the south uh but they the spaniards called it a black legend right this dark malicious lie um about them as this anti-model okay and so that's why i i interchangeably uh label this assignment in this week uh between black legend and spanish colonization i mean the same thing Okay, so that's what we look at here with uh, the handout. So remember, as you saw with number one, is um, I try my best to, um, I'm going to hit the basics, the very basics, Then I'm going to hit a little bit on the PowerPoint, if that's okay, and then I'm going to go back to a little bit more detail, if that's okay. I know that's a little confusing, but I want to give you an overview of what to see, because if I just start spewing facts, about Spanish colonization, you kind of, I, I've been there a million times where you're like, okay, with all with all due respect, professor, uh, what exactly am I to write down? Like, what, what is the most relevant data, you know? And so I, I get that. So let's, um, let's, let's frame our, um, our discourse, right? Our, 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 our dialogue, our debate uh, around these numbers. Okay. So number one, is I am going to, and I had a tongue in cheek when I wrote this one, okay, uh, from 
the book uh, by Boyle, Toward the Setting Sun, uh, I thought personally that he absolutely left Christopher Columbus off the hook exceedingly, uh, making excuses for him. Okay. But I thought it was thought provoking. The old school history, this historical interpretation is pretty almost obsolete. Uh, not many people have the guts to try to do this uh, anymore because it's so politically incorrect. And so at any rate, right, we look for evidence of uh, Columbus being stuck between a rock and a hard place, uh, metaphorically, right? Uh, he, he felt a great urge to um, extricate himself and his family from poverty. And this was the route that he saw um, as his salvation, as his chance, right? And clearly, much of what he did, there's evidence, uh, he was, it was, it was directly or it was indirectly uh, mandated by his creditors, uh, those who had lent him the money and expected to get their money back with um, interest, right? So we're going to get back to some details on that soon. So at any rate, we're going to go over soon, like some of the stuff he did, uh, particularly in the Caribbean, uh, when he made his four voyages there in the 1490s. And um, to what extent do you think that's true with number one? Okay. And so remember, uh, what you're simply doing is saying what the thesis is of whichever section you choose. You give me an example or two of how the writer tried to defend such thesis. And then lastly, you are telling me why you do or do not um, esteem the, the particular section's thesis to be credible, believable, okay? And of course, that matters not which side you take. Uh, all that matters on the second part, the final part of your, your the evaluation part is your defense, right? Briefly defend why you think it is or is not credible. That's the important part, all right? So we'll get back to that, but that's what you're looking at with number one, should you choose that one. And please remember, try to read all of them because almost literally every section is tied to a test question, okay, when you take tests one, two, and three. Spain enslaved by the prejudices of her time. And again, I give much away, right, with my titles. So this, this is another one in which I am patriotically trying to defend the Spanish, okay, as colonizers of the Americas. Now, note, I don't shy away in my selection of facts from some of the very ethnocentric, right, like putting your culture first uh, very arrogantly uh, and judgmentally in and, and, and the way that you uh, behave, uh, behave with and perceive uh, other people around you and other cultures around you. I don't hold back on bloodshed uh, in the name of God. Okay, you'll see plenty of evidence of that on number two. So I certainly, right, uh, do not try to paint a picture that could stand up to modern uh, standards and modern uh, scrutiny. Looking at this stuff, it's clearly going to make you you know, uh, wince, okay? But that's not the point. The point is they lived in a completely different world from the one we live in and that there's evidence that that was all they knew. That was their worldview. That was their way of seeing things back then. And then there's a term called historicism, and it implies that people are largely a product of their upbringing the whole nature versus nurture argument, right, as to what really molds us most predominantly. So this one is all about nurture, about how the Spaniards in the early modern period, the 1500s primarily and 1600s, uh, did not know any better. Okay, so uh, we'll get further into that uh, soon. And then number seven, seven i don't know where that came from number three all right hierarchical spain 
this one now, I am clearly critical of Spain. This one, I am clearly criticizing it according to modern um, measuring stick barometer. Okay. So in this one, um, today, right, we like to put everyone on equal footing as far as their inherent worth, as far as their opportunities, as far as the rights that they're entitled to, um, etc. Contrast that with what you read in number three. You're going to have a clear aristocracy. Right. And Aristoi in Greek means the best. So led by a group of people who claim that they're the better sort. Right. You're going to find a society that was very inequitable. Right. I-N-E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Inequitable to me is primarily economically imbalanced or unfair. Right. We have a small group like an oligarchy, as the Greeks called it, uh, who owns most of the land, who has most of the revenue um, producing opportunities available to them, whereas most of the people are, are relatively, compared to them, uh, marginalized. And marginalized, right, is that you're kind of kicked to the corner, you're excluded, the opportunities of citizenship, et cetera, are not offered to you. Okay, so you're going to see that here in all three categories that history tends to divide into. Okay, we borrowed it right from uh, Durkheim and other sociologists, as we oftentimes put history into the political category of governmental, legal, right, occurrences, the economic category which is self-explanatory, and the social category of how people interact, how they, what they believe, their culture, right, um, etc. So in all three of those categories, right, I try to convey the fact that the Spanish were very um, inequitable, unfair, imbalanced, okay, hierarchical. A clear pyramid, right? Of one one echelon, one class above the other. All right, so we'll get into that soon. Number four, this is more informative. So I'm okay if you choose number four, if you uh if you let that be known that you've observed that, because it's true. Okay. What I tried to do is there is such a, a broad spectrum of interpretation of the, 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 the missions, especially those in California, right, that um, I wanted to give you a little bit of truth to each one, each of the major interpretations, and just kind of say generically that Spanish missions were a mixed bag. There's a little bit of truth to all of these interpretations. So the interpretations, right? The first one is called court history, uh, C-O-U-R-T. And that is like a um, um, an emperor or king or queen in his or her court ask a scribe to write a, um, a history of him or her and his or her kingdom. Well, the selection of facts that that scribe engages in the omission, right, of leaving other facts out, the interpretation of those facts that were selected by the historian, and the presentation of those facts are likely going to be colored in such a way for that scribe to keep his head, right? He's going to praise the king. He is going to praise his kingdom. He's going to justify everything that he did, even seemingly immoral. He's going to find a way to make an excuse for it. So like that, right, we call that court history with different nations. Where they just, they praise themselves. They pat themselves in the back, right, as the winners. 
And again, when I think of winners, I think of all three categories. You take over governmentally, uh, you take over economically, and you can even control the dissemination of ideas and culture socially. And that way you definitively win in history. So the court history oftentimes starts with the hagiographies. Hey you don't need to know that word, but a hagiography hey is a, uh, a written biography by a clergyman about another clergyman. And in the effort, right, they make no bones about it, um, in the overt effort of trying to uh, promote that person to sainthood, okay? So there was a, um, a gentleman with the last name of Palau, P-A-L-A-O, or no, A-U, sorry, Palau. He wrote a very famous biography on Sarah. Right, Junipero Serra, spelt like Junipero, and then S E R R A. So he writes that, right? He's trying to make Sarah a saint. And so he is going to find facts. He's going to present them in such a way, interpret them in such a way that makes the Spaniards look wonderful in everything they did. Even if they have to make villains. Um, you know, or helpless children of the Native Americans on the missions, right? Then you have also, um, after the civil rights movement, you had conflict historians, right? And remember, conflict history, that is when you believe, you look for conflict, you look at competition for power and domination, right? And, and, and self-enrichment between different demographics of society. And remember, demographic is just a category of society. It could be your ethnicity, your nation of origin, your gender, your age, your occupation, what you do for a living, right? Your wealth, etc. And with court history, right? And the way that's much different from, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in a way that's much different from court history, Conflict history makes villains of those who won. Instead of justifying everything they did, it makes villains of them. It basically teaches you in the history book that the bad guys won. And it tries to elicit your sympathy for those who lost. Okay? Some of the most popular conflict historians are a bit, a bit or, or outright Marxist, right? Named after Karl Marx. M-A-R-X, whereby he believed, right, that especially when we turned into a capitalist system, but even long before then, under feudalism, that there is, um, for one person to, to gain economically, it's oftentimes been at the suffering and the cost of another person. So hence, it, it there have been a series of, of chapters in economic history that are very um, parasitical in nature. One person grew wealthy by gobbling up another demographic. And again, as conflict historians, those who gobbled the others up are villains, right? So at any rate, they look into the missions and they put it right away that the... Um, the the priests and the friars, right? The Franciscan of the Franciscan order of the Catholic Church of Spain uh, tried in virtually every way um, to um, to kill off the Native Americans. Uh, that everything was about power, everything was about their own enrichment. They uh, they they um, un you know uh, repentantly. Uh, exploited the Native Americans, uh, etc. They were um, ethnocentric, right? Only the Spanish worldview and culture were the uh, 
the justified, um, just, you know, the um, acceptable uh, norms for anyone around them to accept. And then you had, in the mid to late 90s, people who said, well, what about also about unintended consequences, right? Unintended consequences. And so this, aside from the old school history books, they want to look at it, things in a new way and so forth. So it's also kind of revisionist. They want to revise or change the, the, the romantic ver version of things that initially came out. But it's not as controversial and it's not as um, confrontational. Uh, instead of looking at winners and losers, villains and victims, right? They said, well, what about, you know, the way that the Spanish hurt the Native Americans but didn't necessarily mean to? So, of course, the main, right, um, the main episode with that, that that is most salient, that stands out the most to me, is a disease, for instance, right? Another uh, kind of change from just simply doing the good guy, bad guy uh, kind of game and characterization was the stressing the agency of those at the bottom, right? A-G-E-N-C-Y, saying they weren't just helpless victims, these Native Americans. They made decisions that mattered. They had power. They had leverage, and they used it at times. Okay, and we'll look into that as well. So all of those are different ways of looking at, interpreting, presenting the history of the California missions. And so I just threw in you know, support a little bit of supportive evidence for each one of those interpretations. And then just generically said it was a mixed bag. So intellectually, nothing impressive uh, by me on number four. But preparing you, should any of you become, you know, history uh, majors, then then I think it's 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 worthwhile because you're getting a little introduction to each of the different major interpretations that you're going to come across. Okay. And let me see, I think there's maybe one more. Yeah. Number five, this is deflection. This is deflection, especially in light of as a counter to number three, right? The Spanish had a very inequitable unfair, hierarchical, right, undemocratic um, society. And I'm saying, was English Virginia in the colonial period any better? And it's a rhetorical question where the answer is already implied. No, it was not. It was just as backward, just as aristocratic, just as inequitable, etc. So, in light of that, if you'll, uh, I hope that I gave just enough information uh, to let you understand the gist before you even read them, hypothetically, if you haven't yet, um, uh, but also equip you to, uh, to make a decision as to which one, or, um, you know, elicits your interest the most, okay? Um, and also begin the beginnings of a dialogue. Uh, today. All right. Uh, so with the Black Legend, you have, right, um, in the uh, 1490s, you have the four, the four uh, voyages of Christopher Columbus. And yes, he was from Genoa, Italy, right? And that happened quite often, right? Because oftentimes, uh, the word for bank, for instance, is bench. And these merchants, in cities like Florence, et cetera, and, and Seville, Spain, would literally line up on certain days, special days, and almost like the Shark Tank show, they would line people up and ask them one by one, why do I want to lend my money to you, right, of all other people? And very generically, very generally, according to this book that I read and, and try to paraphrase on number one, he said Columbus gave the very generic, simple, right answer, most effective answer, 
not right. That implies morality, uh, but effective in getting what he wanted. As he simply said, I will do whatever it takes. I will do whatever you ask, whatever you want. Okay? And that seems to have worked well for him. So at times, right, uh, we know at least once uh, he went to um, he went to uh, Elmina or Luanda. There were two big um, Ivory Coast slave depots that the Europeans would um, would arrive to and uh, trade in uh, and purchase slaves on moss, like tons of them at once. Oftentimes, Columbus did that. Um, he also fought over the Moluccas Islands in Indonesia, which did not belong to his native Genoa or Italy, as it was in different city-states at that time, nor did it belong to the Dutch, who were claiming it was theirs, right? So he would go into these Moluccas Islands, which, as you know, were known as the Spice Islands, and he would try to literally fight off uh, the Dutch and other competitors began to cultivate the, the spices and sell them and continually keep a naval little regiment, if you will, prepared to fight off competitors and hold on to those islands. And they were won and lost back and forth several times over. But notice, right, he's doing some, by today's standards, some immoral stuff. Uh, capturing human slaves, taking them from point A to point B, where they're going to, in some cases, be worked to death. In some cases, they're going to die along the voyage in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, lay claim to Indonesian islands and fight with another European group, uh, neither of whom, to whom that those islands belong, rightfully, uh, just so that they can they could literally die and kill for spices to put on food for crying out loud. Okay. So when he goes on his first voyage to the Bahamas, right? He writes back to Ferdinand and tells him, here's what I see. I see this, that, and I don't recall the details of all the different types of, um, of, of foods. Uh, fruits, vegetables, uh, wood, and other natural resources that caught his eye, and he put into this famous letter. But what I do remember, and most people remember, have they read it even one time, is that he ends by saying, and oh, by the way, if you would like to have slaves, I'd be happy to capture as many as you like. He said, um, their uh, their military technology is primitive, he said several times over. They know not iron, right? They don't know iron weaponry. And so he says, with 50 men, he literally uses that number, with 50 men, I could take any of these islands I want with 50 soldiers. So you say the word if you want slaves. It sounds so callous to read this. Uh, and for years, it's been in a book called Major Problems in American History. And what's interesting about this book is each chapter, there's not a narrative of what happened and, and um, an interpretation as to why it happened that way. That's called, uh, you know, a secondary source, right? A history book that we're familiar with. But these are primary sources. This is just something that was written by one person who lived at that time and was part, you know, in time and space of that event and left a mark on it. And so that that major problems in American history book, it's filled with just primary sources of quotes, letters and stuff, really cool stuff. And it starts off with a bang, right, with this one. But boy, does it have another a uh, very uh, gut-wrenching letter in that Major Problems in American History book that we're going to get to very soon, is according to the diary written by his son, 
right? He had Bartolomeo and Diego Columbus, his two brothers, and put them in charge one after another. Um, and his son, I want to say Nicholas, I, shame on me, but his son uh, wrote just as much in the diary as he, Christopher Columbus, did. Okay, it's kind of a joint diary of the two, father and son. And uh, he gives us uh, a narration of how, and I guess, how everything went awry. Okay. So supposedly, Columbus comes as a decent human being, contending, I want to trade with you. I want to find something that is of, um, of great worth back in Spain. Right. And um, I also want to claim some of the land. Right. For uh, for Mother Spain and the Catholic Church and Catholic faith. But I won't take it all. I won't dispossess you. In fact, we'll become allies. From what I understand, coming in here in the, into the Caribbean, uh, you are fearful of the hated um, Caribs that the Caribbean's named after because the first tribe he made a deal with were the Arawak, A-R-A-W-A-K. And so he makes this, you know, and so he's thinking things are going well. And he's very condescending. He said, you know, these people, they don't know weapons. They swim right up to our ship. They grab our swords out of ignorance and cut their hands because they know not steal. Um, he said they, um, a lot of them, uh, are as naked as the day they were born or with a small little loincloth. And, and it surprised him that they felt no shame. And if you remember from the Bible, right? Remember Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, before they sinned, they were naked and they didn't know it, right? And you see like a little toddler, a little baby who could become naked and run around and think nothing of it. They're innocent, right? And so... That's how he kind of began to look at these natives, is that they were just, they were childlike, innocent. Like it was like going back to Eden before the fall of Adam and Eve. Okay. He also was um, condescending about the ability to, so not only about their nakedness, also about their weaponry and their ability to defend themselves. Also about their religion. He said most of them didn't even seem to have a religion. Or if they did, it was, you know, with these little idols that they kept in their huts that did not impress him at all as far as their religious development. And then also he says, right, that they were that they were they were backward or innocent or childlike, and that they did not have um. A, a very shrewd sense of trading. They said his men would would grab just what they held to be very valuable things. And of course, on the island of Espanola, which is Dominican Republic and Haiti, they were granted golden masks, golden nose rings, golden earrings, right? And so um, they're like, okay, guys, where'd you get that? We'd like to see more of that stuff, right? And he said that they they gratefully just gave everything off the 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 term we would use today, right? Is they they happily gave the shirt off their back. And he said, oftentimes for almost nothing in return from the Spaniards. So on on more than one occasion, he tells his Spanish men that no, you are not going to take advantage of them. Uh, when you take something valuable and I notice it. I will, I'm going to command that you give them something of value in return. Because he said, not only did he feel like that was only right, but he also felt like the Native Americans might open their eyes to the fact that they're getting the short end of the stick and they might become angry, right? And resentful from it. And also, he said he was already planning to have them convert to Christianity into the Catholic Catholic Christianity. And he didn't want to give them a bad taste in their mouth about how Catholics behave and treat them. Let 
all right? One thing that shows up uh, time and again, because uh, I not too long ago, I went back and read this diary, is, is I, I don't know how to get around it, you guys. The, the violation of women. Uh, a lot of the Spanish soldiers, uh, it was noted down, uh, raped Native American women. And the Native Americans, at more than one occasion, uh, went to war against them for it. Okay? And then, yes, there were areas like Sabao on Hispaniola Island and in places in Puerto Rico at, where they found silver and gold or they were looking for silver and gold and expected to find it, right, following the gifts that they had received and other clues. And they began conflict doing that. But going back to Columbus, right, is he was granted a, a, a great endowment, a great subsidy from Ferdinand and Isabella, telling him to go, go forward and capture pagan land. That's what they knew back then. Right, so we're not talking about just grab uncontested land, right? Uninhabited land, but no, even if there are plenty of inhabitants on that land, as long as they're pagan, you could fight them and take it from them. And you had the blessing of Pope Alexander the Sixth, who himself happened to be Spanish at that time, and you had the blessing of Ferdinand and Isabella. But under the Alexandrian bulls, right, a papal bull, B-U-L-L, -L, uh, especially like at the Treaty of Tordesillas, T-O-R-D-E-S-I-L-L-A-S, -L -L uh, they were granted these lands, these pagan lands, but in return, the Pope commanded that they convert to the Catholic Church and holy faith of Christianity, uh, the Native Americans. So I'm not trying to let Columbus off the hook at all. I'm just trying to give you a better, more complete context, right? The whole situation around which all this was happening. And then not to mention, Ferdinand and Isabella especially, they both had their own family members fighting against them for the throne. Ferdinand had his brother trying to claim the throne from him. Isabella had the supporters of her niece and her dying brother uh, wanting to give it to his daughter, her niece, the throne, rather than his sister, Isabella. But what they had seen, what they experienced, is the end of the reconquest of southern Spain. In 711, Spain has a unique history in this respect. Spain was invaded and conquered, about three quarters of it, they say, by North African and Arabic Muslim army and soldiers called the Moors, right? In 711, under Ibn al Tariq. And so, at di different times in history, you had different Spanish mini kingdoms and all these different states, you know, uh, Leon, Castillo, Navarre, um, uh, what is it, Catalonia, Barcelona, etc. Anyway, all these different areas, one by one, began to declare basically a holy war against the Muslim leader who oftentimes stayed. Um, in the south, uh, in, in Cordoba, uh, Spain, at the bottom. Well, in 1492, that same year, they finally pushed him out of Cordoba. And I think he went to one more city, like Granada, and as his last kind of Alamo. And they kicked him out. They, they defeated him there as well. But they were so desperate, right, uh, to try to... Uh, to gain a sense of legitimacy in the eyes of their own people. So they didn't go with their siblings and, and, and uh, Isabella with, with her niece instead of with her. 
They felt they needed to secure their sense of legitimacy by conquering foreign lands. And that it would just kind of divert everyone's attention, make everyone proud of them, uh, make them look more respectable, right? And make them look as if God was on their side, right? In their endeavors uh, elsewhere. But going back to Spain, what they had made a practice of is granting commoners and, and aristocrats, for that matter, the right to arm themselves, fight against the infidel, right? And in, in literally a holy war uh, declared by the by the popes, like three different popes. Um, and um, should you win, you are rewarded Hidalgo status, right? So Hidalgo was like, you're kind of nouveau riche. You were just a commoner before, but you fought so well, you were granted minor noble, noble status and privileges, lands, powers that came with that. So one of them was like, um, you could become the, uh, um, the uh, adelantado. The adelantado, like the word adelante, means like go forward was someone who went forward and won pagan lands over and became like a rural as opposed to one in a city that had more sophistication to it, uh, governor. And Adelantado, A-D-E-L-A-N-T-A-D-O, uh, was like uh, a conquering agrarian uh, governor, if you will. So they could become an, uh, an Adelantado. They could be granted an encomienda, right? E-N-C-O-M-I-E-N-D-A. Encomienda was the right to, uh, to, uh, force, to force labor of those that you had defeated in battle. So you had that as well. So the idea is, right, is, and then also in Spain, they had something called the mayorazgo. Uh, El hijo mayor means the oldest son. So mayorazgo was like primogenitor in English. The, the hijo mayor, the oldest son, got everything that had been earned from dad. So what do you know when you look at these conquerors, as they called themselves, these conquistadores that flooded from Spain? Most of them came from these two states of Castile, especially, and Aragon. They had seen oftentimes their own fathers and family members and neighbors uh, fight in a holy war and enrich themselves and their family from it. And a lot of them, of course, were second, third, and fourth sons, right? Who didn't get the property of dad like the eldest son did. So there's kind of that pattern that you could see, okay? Then in 1502, uh, 10 years after the first voyage, they established the first um, uh, kind of a hierarchy, if you will. Okay. And you'll see that hierarchy on number three. You had the vice king, the virrey or viceroy, uh, who was like the king in the king's place. It was nice to be viceroy. Okay. Coming here to the Americas. You also had, he had power to uh, nominate the governors, right? The gobernadores. Uh, the governors uh, worked with the, it's kind of a fancy word, the corregidores. Uh, like the word corregir means to correct in Spanish. And so it's like, let me write it real quickly. So the corregidores, right? They would come to the pueblos, to the cities. And they could demand however many Native Americans they wanted uh, to come fight uh, for them in the army, however many of them they needed to pave a road, to build a cathedral or church or mission, any kind of public works. The corregidores came in. But like the verb, corregir, to, to correct, can be found in that word, right? They also could veto or correct decisions made by the city councils. The cabildos. All right. So the cabildos were the most democratic local thing body that there was. 
right? These uh these these reps of the city. So the corredores oftentimes were very hated. Then in addition to that, and the viceroy and all that, right? You had a system of judges known as the audiencia, right? And so they were judges and they were handpicked, well-educated Spaniards, right? Who had a lot of power, not only to referee or adjudicate disputes, but to pass sentence on the, any type of, of criminal activity, uh, suspicion of criminal activity, etc. cetera. Uh, determine things with wills, contested property, all that. Then in addition to the audiencia, you also had uh, the consulado. The consulado got, they were the um, monopoly organization. They were able to decide who could do what for a living under this mercantilist economy. So Spanish America was not a capitalist economic system. So the consulado, the big money makers were uh, slavery, sadly. Uh, sugar, cocoa, mining, right? Those were kind of the big ones, the big money makers early on. The, you had to have the proper papers to do any of those things. And then I kid you not, in addition to that, they had for a, for a short period of time, those who were granted status to to colonize in certain areas, to be granted adelantado status, to be granted a seat on the audiencia, et cetera, had to have cleanness of blood. That's what that term says in Spanish. Crazy, huh? You had to be a pure Spaniard, which is ridiculous when you look at the history of Spain and how ethnically diverse its history is. You had the Celtic people come in and intermarry with the native Iberians. You had the Romans come in when it was called Hispania. You had the Visigoths who were Germanic come and take over after Rome fell. You had the Moors come over from North Africa, uh, descending from the Berbers. And then you had a large influx of Arabs, of Arabic people coming in. So, I mean, give me a break, cleanness of blood. So, um. Yeah. So all this terrible stuff, right? And by the way, they formed what they call, some people call a pigmentocracy. I'm not going to go through more Spanish names than I need to. Um, but they had a name for Spaniards. Uh, they had a couple names for them. They had names for Spaniards who were born in the Americas. Uh, the Creoles, right, Criollos, uh, as opposed to the Peninsulares from the Iberian Peninsula of Spain itself. And there was a grand difference back then between those two categories. And then if you married a Native American woman, because in 1511, uh, Ferdinand made a concession and said, you know what, I can't stop it anyway. Uh, um, he said, miscegenation is, is legal, okay? And miscegenation is inter-ethnic uh, marriage and or sex and procreation. So they had miscegenation laws that allowed it, kind of grudgingly, but allowed it nevertheless. And so when a Spaniard married a Native American, right, an Indio, the child, for instance, had its own name, right? They called it a mestizo. M-E-S-T-I-Z-O. So to this day, a lot of people contend like Mexico, Guatemala, a lot of the Central American countries, with the exception of Costa Rica, are known as um, mestizo nations, right, in their ethnic makeup. And a lot of them now are proud of that. Uh, so at any rate, um, yeah, so you have this chart they made. And so people would tell their kids, right? All right, you know, uh, and then black and white, they had a word we don't use anymore, uh, mulatto, 
uh, the, the biracial child, and they would tell that biracial child, that mestizo child, they would encourage them oftentimes, hey, get a better life for yourself, marry a Spaniard. Then, because the child would then be called a castizo. And then if that child marries a Spaniard, then that child's child will become known as a Spaniard. So you can marry yourself back up. And I kid you not, if you did some great act of bravery or public service, like saved a rich man's child from drowning in a local river, etc., they would give you a certificate treating you as if you were Spanish, even though ethnically, perhaps to the to the vision of the dark pigment of your skin, you clearly are not. Uh, they're called uh, gracias, right? Thank you, al sacar notes. And you don't need to really know that, but just kind of FYI, just in case you get on Jeopardy. And of course, what were the two main avenues? They've been the, the two main avenues, you guys, under so many civilizations uh, of, of socioeconomic ascendance, of moving up. Uh, the church and the military became known as a pious priest or monk. You could rise up. And if you were a, a brave and successful soldier, you could rise up. But Columbus, right, showed that there was now a third route, and that was becoming um, a merchant, right? Uh, take do it, uh, Playing with other people's money and promising them that you're going to give them a return on that money by the time you get back, right? You're going to make more money out of it. And then we talked about one more demographic also, as far as achieving socioeconomic ascendance or moving on up. And that is, of course, the conquistadores, right? The conquerors. They name themselves this, of course. The conquerors. And the most famous, arguably right, is Hernan or Hernando uh, Cortes, who uh, somehow almost miraculously uh, defeated the Aztec Empire in, from 1519 to 1521 in Mexico. But then just other a few basic facts. Okay, I'll try to hurry up now. 1540 was a big year. Uh, Vasquez de Coronado, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, uh, was looking for the seven cities of Cibola, C-I-B-O-L-A. They were supposedly, he was told, and a lot of people believe that this was kind of a cruel joke from the Native Americans telling him about these seven cities of gold he kept looking for. Uh, so he went through the Southwest, like uh, Arizona, New Mexico, right, Nevada area saw the Grand Canyon, and made it, some people think, as far as Kansas. But when he came back, right, he said that it was um, that it was unpopulated and that it was um, a wilderness. And so this might have had something to do with Spain not making present-day United States territory a high priority to try to colonize. Because colonize, colonizing has always been, you know, looking at it at an amoral way, has always been uh, uh, expensive. So then a guy named uh, Cabrillo, right? A guy before him was Viscaino, who gave a lot of the initial names of California, going up the coast of California. And Cabrillo went right up to about the Oregon coast and claimed the uh, you know the boundary and so it was a little bit more definitively done and with the, the 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 crown at that time it all just worked out better uh for cabrillo going down in history than viscaino um who came before him so claiming upper and lower alta and baja california right and then um the southeast in the south um Hernando de Soto came in about 1540 as well, 1539. And um, he he kind of lends, you know, to the, the whole black legend thing. 
by the account of his own men, uh, some people to this day wonder if his own men uh, killed him. They said he got sick and died, and they threw his body in the Mississippi. But he was hated by his own men, and he was hated by a lot of tribes around him because he chose, as sometimes Columbus did, uh, to be to be feared rather than loved. So one thing that he would do, right, is he was engaged, he would engage in extortion. When they would get low on supplies, and he's going up the Mississippi and going through the present day South, um, he would grab even women and children, and threaten to have them killed if they didn't get corn and certain amount of food and things that they desperately needed. So he made a lot of enemies, and Cabeza de Vaca, uh, not such, um, right? He uh, he and a guy named um, Estebanico. And Esteban or Stephen, right? Estebanico was a, a a black Moor who was a servant to the Spaniards. He was a secretary to the Spaniards. And um, in 1528, they went to Florida, right? And I think Ponce de Leon named it that in 1511. Um, yeah, Julian. I sent you a message in the chat. If you would read it, please. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. No, absolutely. I I I empathize with you on that one. That's terrible. All right, I have you down. Okay. Um Yeah, so let's see here. Uh so they um they were attacked by the well-established Florida uh, indigenous groups and um, the Appalachee, the Tallahassee and other uh, uh, confederations supposedly were militarily very, um, uh, you know, um, uh, formidable. And so they had to flee. And he has a, a story. It's one of the first autobiographical writings, right, in the 1530s. Uh, of he, Cabeza de Vaca, and Estebanico, his partner, um, who alone made it, um, all the, just the crazy odyssey that they went through. And it's a very interesting uh, read. But to the Spanish, right, they also contend as early as 1528 that this was part of Spain, just his story alone, um, gave them first rights as colonizers uh, over the South, uh, over the English. And we'll get back to more on justification and all that, uh, probably beyond today. And uh, as you may know, the oldest surviving city uh, in the United States to this day is St. Augustine, Florida, and it was established by the Spanish in 1565 by Pedro Menendez de Avalos. And he kind of goes down in history as a villain a bit as well because of the Fort Caroline uh, episode. Uh, there were uh, French Protestants known as the Huguenot uh, who were establishing um, a fort and a, a mini colony uh, there somewhere between Georgia and Florida. And he had them massacred. And it's one thing to massacre in war, but he had them captured. They gave up. They surrendered. And just there were hundreds of them. And um, he had their throats slit. Uh, so at any rate, um, then 1599, Don Juan de Oñate claimed New Mexico. And like I put in here, turmoil, turmoil. Note, okay, that uh, there are books such as When Jesus Came, the Corn Mothers Went Away by a man named Gutierrez. All right. It is conflict history. The Spanish were awful villains. Everything they did had involved an ulterior motive for power and exploitation of resources, etc. And that they clearly, uh, the Native Americans, uh, the Pueblo Natives, as they were called, uh, were in their complete rights uh, to rebel against them. And so uh, 
because of books like that, I subjectively, if I had an instructor tell me that I had to write a book uh, on Spanish American history in, in U.S. territory that adheres to the Black legend, right, that makes villains of the Spaniards, sorry, trying to get a little bit more light, um, I would choose um, New Mexico as my place. There's just so much conflict. There's so much drama. Um, yeah, we've been going on an hour. I, if one person asked me to, I'd be happy to divulge more facts on that. But just know that in 1680, there was a rebellion known as uh, Pope's Rebellion, spelled like Pope, uh, this medicine man. And they uh, crucified a priest over the altar in the Catholic cathedral. And they either killed or chased out every Spaniard from Santa Fe, New Mexico, that in, in a single day. And it took the Spaniards 16 years to conquer it back. So lots of drama in New Mexico. Okay. And then the ordinances of discovery, right? Uh, were were issued in which they contended, right? Uh, in which Philip II contended back in the 1570s, uh, 200 years before this, that he wanted no more conquering, no more rewarding of conquistadores, right? But instead, he wanted the Catholic Church to uh, send its clergy out into the frontiers. And he didn't have the money to do it. Well, now, 200 years later, it happens, right? Uh, under what are called the Bourbon reforms, when you had the Bourbon French family in control of the, of the Spanish crown. And um, yeah, they established 21 famous missions up the coast of California uh, under the Franciscan order. And um, it was meant to be a peaceful alternative uh, to conquest. But make no mind, make no doubt it also, in the primary sources, according to the crowns and the and the visitor general, etc., and we'll talk about the visitor general soon. Um, they uh, they also made it known that this would help keep that make the Native Americans loyal subjects and keep the English and the Dutch and the French at bay in these colonies, keep them away. So it was not just right altruistic religious motives that they were led by. All right, so let's go ahead. So I'm going to go past number one. I feel like we've done enough of one. And like I said, any given time, you want to raise your hand, unmute yourself, please ask me a question. Let me know if you'd like me to go over anything, uh, elaborate more on something. But I usually try to keep these re these meetings um, about an hour. But I'm going to I'm going to jump to two. OK, so like I said, we've we've, we've mentioned quite a bit about Columbus. So Spain enslaved by the prejudice of her time. So the Reconquista, which has already been mentioned, is part of this argument. And notice what I put up here toward the top, too, is the scientific revolution, right, of, of suspending judgment and using good inductive reasoning, right, of gathering facts, measuring things, suspending your judgment until you make and uh, a calculated inference from the uh, the results, right, of your observation, of your experiments, etc. That hadn't come in. The Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was all about, right, uh, natural rights of all human beings. Uh, Voltaire was all about um, the rights of um, every person to speak his or her mind and to differ. Uh, with one another, um, the the 
the sacred nature of everyone's brain, including the poor and anyone for that matter, uh, were uh, Diderot and Condorcet, spelt like Diderot and Condorcet. Uh, they wrote the first French uh, encyclopedias. Okay, so that hadn't happened yet. And then also, and then they also were against dogma in the in the Enlightenment, right? And to me, dogma is just simply you're like, I believe what I believe. Don't show me any evidence to the contrary. I'm unwilling to look at it, right? You're you're being intellectually stubborn. Okay, they were against that. And this one's huge to me. It's classical liberalism in the 1800s. This states basically, right, that society best works. And most naturally, when everyone is the arbiter of his or her own life, world, okay? And here's an interesting thing is then the question arises, right? Well, won't that result in anarchy if everyone could, could let me genuinely do as they please? And there was a famous saying that says, your freedom to swing your fist ends where my nose begins. I thought that was really cool, right? So you could do whatever you want until it infringes on my rights. Then you've gone too far. Now on my rights, right? I'm not talking about you can't hurt my feelings. You can't insult me or anything like that. Uh, but simply, you cannot take away one of my fundamental rights. You can't shut me up, right? Uh, et cetera. So they didn't have that yet. In the 1500s. So they had popes telling them, right, that God was blessing their fight against these villainous people. Um, there was a guy named Castillo uh, fighting for um, uh, Spain, like, like the word castle in Spanish. And Castillo contended that they were brought into the temple of Wichpotli. Don't ask me to spell that one. Uh, but which potly right, and there were all kinds of of, of sacrificial blood, and um, and snakes everywhere as a symbol. And remember, to Christian, right, uh, Christian tradition, the devil uh, turned himself or entered the body of a snake in the Garden of Eden, etc. And so uh, you know that was seen to be demonic, um, and so they. They just thought it was weird uh, that it was more beyond weird that it was it was of the devil it was they didn't believe in coincidences or just, hey, that's odd. But you do your thing. I'll do mine. That Those days hadn't come yet. Right. So that they, they supposedly didn't know any better. That's all they knew that there was God, Satan, good, evil, blank. Uh, and you have a guy named Bernardino de Salgun, uh, S-A-H-A-G-U-N. And he was a priest, and Saul Goon gave us a lot of what we have on the Aztecs, as I mentioned. Uh, but they sacrificed children, and he said uh, the blame should not be imputed on on the people, on the parents, or even on the leaders for that matter, who executed the children, but upon our cruel, ancient enemy, Satan who has blinded them into thinking they must do such an infernal deed. And so even the well-meaning defenders of the rights of natives, right, like Sal Goon, still thought that they were worshiping the devil and they needed to convert, you know, etc. cetera. So it was a different time period I'm, I'm making the argument, okay? And then hierarchical spade, like I said, you have the three categories. So we already did the political one, right? And really, we've done those three. So the political, all those offices that I mentioned, right? Uh, economic, the consulado with the monopolies, right? And um, and by the way, with the economic part and slash political as well, uh, you had something called the repartimiento. R-E-P-A-R-T-I-M-I-E-N-T-O. The repartimiento was the encomienda on a larger scale. The government could commandeer native labor for a public service um, at will. 
and that was known as the repartimiento. Okay. Um, socially, like I said, the pigmentocracy that was established over the pigment of skin. And not to mention, you look at um, you look at Peru, and uh, you have uh, Garcilasco de la Vega and other guys who praised Peruvian things, right? Uh, you look in Mexico, uh, Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz, these other writers, they were all about what was happening in Europe, how they wrote, the style, the meter, the themes. It was all like there wasn't the praise of the indigenous of that which was originally from Mexico, not until much later. All right, and then number four, I pretty much mentioned that. So with the hagiography, you have evidence that people like Sarah protected the natives from the soldiers. The soldiers at the Presidios were there to protect the missionaries. But oftentimes they were at odds with each other because there were a lot of reports of the soldiers raping women and, uh, and engaging in violent acts against the native men. And so uh, it got so bad that Sarah was willing to just risk not having any protection and, and ask for the Presidio uh, to be uh, completely removed from his Pueblo. Uh, and he was at various Pueblos. I don't remember which one as it was at that time. Um, so at any rate, um, yeah, you have that. Uh, then with the uh, the conflict history, uh, a guy named Van Kotzebue. Uh, Van Kotzebue, uh, he was a priest. And it was like V-A-N and then K-A-T-Z-E-B-U-E, -E, something like that. Anyway, he famously went on um, this tour of multiple missions. And he said that they basically were coercive institutions that the natives were forced virtually to do everything from sun up to sundown and that that including uh being physically um attacked physically uh punished by the friars and others so you have evidence of that of them having to uh shred all vestiges of their own culture especially their own religion absolutely that seems to be beyond a shadow of a doubt. So in a sense, it was kind of a, it could be depicted as kind of a cultural genocide. And then exploitation. You have people uh, like at San Jose, uh, Narciso Duran. Uh, Mr. Duran, supposedly, according to multiple witnesses, uh, ran the San Jose mission like a sweatshop. With native labor. The native agency later on, right, from the 90s and so forth in history books. There's evidence that the Native Americans knew that they were um, their labor was was wanted by both the Asendados, the Hacienda owners, right, of the of the ranches and farms that were supposed to feed the Pueblo, the city, and the missionaries. And uh, the the mission, uh, the missionaries themselves, and then I don't remember the details, but there were times in which even the soldiers were desperate for for if not the labor, uh, certain products that were sold by the natives in their area, you know, being in such a secluded area, away from everything, and the natives, uh, according to many accounts, were no dummies. They took advantage of it. They bargained over salaries, telling the hacendados, how much will you pay me? This guy will pay me this much. If you're not willing to pay me that much, no thank you. Uh, how much do you want this commodity uh, to the soldiers? What are you willing to pay for it? And so you have evidence of that. You have evidence of natives being uh, increasingly allowed to leave. Uh, as you may know, 
at first, the natives were not allowed to leave the missions because the fear was, is once they go home, they'll revert to their pagan ways, return to their pagan religions, and they'll end up going to hell. And everything done for their soul will have been for naught. And so uh, as they had rebellions, right, like uh, one of the most famous was Stanislaus, right, that Stanislaus County is named after uh, at San Jose. You had rebellions. Uh, you had just different acts of defiance so that the missionaries kind of decided along with the, the, the soldiers that, you know what, we need to give them a little bit more leeway. We need to have certain times, certain seasons where they can leave the mission to go hunt, uh, to go uh, harvest their their old village's uh, food, uh, to see some of their family members who have not entered the missions, uh, et cetera. So there's evidence of natives, right, showing their own agency and not just being passive victims to everything. And then harm, like I said, a lot of it was... Um, unintentional you have here diphtheria dysentery measles influenza tuberculosis right you have also um uh the change of flora and fauna right uh supposedly for instance like pigs just destroyed all kinds of stuff being introduced to the missions uh and other animals like that all right and then number five is the English were not any better. You have in you have evidence of nepotism, of a lot of the same people being on the same uh, council that are related to one another. Okay, um, you have um, uh, evidence of monopolies, uh, etc. So if you want to take a look at that, I would recommend reading all of them. By the way. All right. And uh, but also a couple things for the test is the English. Uh, the English were not as willing to allow their slaves to gain, earn or buy their own freedom known as manumission. Uh, it happened a lot less frequently under the English. There was a lot more arguably um, ethnic intolerance where they did not want to have. Uh, communities of quote free negroes hamza sorry it's a bit of an off topic question but i was wondering um are we able to view uh the recorded lectures in case you know we miss any information absolutely yeah absolutely i'm gonna get some help on that i apologize um uh to get that done uh because i i myself don't quite know how to do it but i know someone who does and so okay, i'll, yeah, I'll try no to worries. get on that okay Okay, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. Thank you for putting it, bringing it to my attention. Appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. All right. And so, um, does anybody have any other questions? Any general questions? I know there's a lot of data today. Uh, there's just so much to cover. There's so much that can be covered, and so much that we still even didn't didn't do uh, today. But I'm not going to torture you that much. An hour and a half <laughs> is sufficient. Okay. All right. Well, you guys, um, you guys have a great week. Okay. Thank you for waiting so late in the week to to look over this, uh, Mr. Ochoa. I wish you the best uh, with what happened to you today. Um, that that really stinks. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for letting me still back in the meeting. No problem. I Yeah, no problem at all. All right. That's definitely a bad day. All right. And so um, you guys hang in there. Okay. Thank you. Clara, thank you for letting me see a face. It, it, it just feels like more like I'm in class. So I appreciate that. All right. And that's no pressure on anybody else. Most people don't. Uh, but like I said, it's just kind of nice every now and then to see that I'm, I'm um, see proof that I'm talking to human beings. <laughs> all right. So you guys have a great night, a great week, and hang in there, okay? There we go. There's another one. So thank you. And we'll we'll go ahead and call it a week, okay? Have a good week. All right. Thank you. Well, Goodbye. Bye-bye.